Thanks for joining me on today's 172nd Air Wing video. We've got up for review the Hobby Master's rendition of the Hellenic Air Force or uh, EPA F4E uh, in the upgraded AUP configuration. Uh, this was circa 2019 during the display for the Dutch Air Force Days Air Show and Invitational. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the history of the F4E, a little bit of the recapping of the uh, aircraft service with the uh, Hellenic or Greek Air Force, and unfortunately we will have to touch on some tragic news that happened with this aircraft after the model was released. 
but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. First, let's chat a little bit about the purpose of this channel. Uh, what I do is I make reviews of uh, 172nd scale models that I have personally purchased. And as part of that effort, I put some historical background into my video reviews because I think that um, fighter jets should be discussed as a whole, you know, not just the people flying in the front and the back seat, but also the supporting team behind the scenes who may not necessarily get their 15 minutes of fame on the big screen, but who are nonetheless critical for any fighter jet to ever fly in the air. And as a result, I put some time in my videos to the real world story of some of the aircraft that I review. And again, in this instance, I am unfortunately compelled to share some unfortunately tragic info with this release. Um, further, we're also going to talk about some of the modifications that I've done to this model since it came out of the box, which personally I think brings just an extra touch of realism to this release that Hobby Master probably can't afford to incorporate at a price that's digestible to collectors such as myself. So first, uh, before we get into all that stuff, let's talk about the history of the F4E. Uh, the first F4 Phantom II uh, came out in 1958 and was declared initially operationally capable by the U.S. Navy in 1962. Uh, after its adoption by the U.S. Navy, uh, the U.S. Air Force purchased their own variant under direction of Secretary of Defense at the time, Robert McNamara. That happened to be one of the better decisions that McNamara would have as his term of Secretary of Defense. Um, the F-4 would go on to serve in Vietnam, where some of the lessons that um, were somewhat obvious to people now as airplane designers were learned and relearned over the skies of Southeast Asia. One of the things that the Air Force and McDonnell Douglas, the builder of this aircraft, saw fit to incorporate in a follow-on version was an internal gun. The first F-4 Phantoms were not equipped with a cannon. They simply had the radar because it was believed at the time that cannons were obsolete. And because cannons were considered obsolete, there was no need to incorporate cannons. So this turned out to not be the case, although for reasons that might actually go against some of the internet wisdom on the topic. Uh, many people think that the gun was um, added to the F-4 because of close-range combat, and while that is a factor, the primary reason from the perspective of the U.S. Air Force was actually not because of dogfights. It should be remembered that in any given theater, uh, maneuvering fights between airplanes are relatively uncommon, as expressed of a proportion of the airplanes that ever deploy to a theater. Uh, the majority of uh, air to air engagements in Southeast Asia, as cited by U.S. Air Force studies of uh, the post war, I should say the post war studies of Vietnam, found that 60% uh, of the victories, whether by the North Vietnamese or by the U.S. side, were surprises. So, in these instances, the majority of instances of air to air engagements, there was no turning at all. It was an airplane shooting down another one and the victim had no idea they were being targeted until they were hit and went down in flames. So this is in line with what some of the statistics from other wars would tell you, and it runs in contravention to some of the um, ace combat, top gun style culture that's of course promoted because at the end of the day, a dogfight sells more movie tickets and more video games than a boring uh, ambush where the victim airplane doesn't even get a chance to fight back because they're shot down out of the blue um, as a surprise attack. And that, of course, goes all the way back to Baron von Richthofen of the German side in World War I, right? So returning to the F-4, the uh, people at McDonnell Douglas met with the Air Force and began designs of an upgraded version which would incorporate a 20 millimeter cannon which was installed in the front of the aircraft in this section here and the barrel would come down and you see the little shroud here that is rendered very accurately in reflective titanium um, as is done on the Hellenic Air Force F-4s. Uh, the shroud is different colors depending on the country that operated them so that's why I point that out. Uh, the 20 millimeter cannon was integrated mostly to assist with ground attacks um, 
the C to ensure that any Air Force F4 could respond to a troops in contact situation, uh, the F-4 could come in and be used as a close air support aircraft if the need arose. And this was key because the um, Air Force F-4s had to travel a long way to get to the fight in Southeast Asia. They generally had to go from the hinterlands of Thailand over Laos and then into North Vietnam. And to do that, it was a very long journey. They had to travel a 980-mile trip from Thailand uh, to run a mission, which meant a lot of stress on the fuel supply of the aircraft. Um, even with air mid-air refueling, the F-4s were somewhat range challenged and um, the centerline pylon, which you see right here, would um, that, en that encompassed about 600 gallons of fuel, which is of course very crucial when you're flying over 900 miles into and out of a combat zone. This area would be taken up by a gun pod, which used up a station, reduced the amount of fuel available, and influenced whether or not uh, an aircraft could actually respond to a troops in contact situation. Because if you had um, two F-4s that had gun pods out of a flight of four, you know, the other two, the wingmen, could not carry them because they needed the fuel in order to escort or fly wing with their leader. So you have flight of four F-4s, and only two of them could carry 20 millimeter guns, which meant if there was a troops in contact situation uh, where friendly troops needed close air support, then you're looking at a situation where only two out of the four airplanes could respond. And for obvious reasons, that's not necessarily an acceptable use of firepower. Uh, you don't want to tell somebody that's in desperate need of close air support by cannon fire that you're unable to help because you don't have any guns. So uh, not a good position to be in from a close air support perspective, which is one major reason why the F-4E, the version you uh, roughly see here, was redesigned to encompass the cannon. That variant first flew in 1967 and would go on to establish a distinguished combat record in Southeast Asia and in the Middle East in the service of the Israeli uh, Air Force, or IDFAF. That is a story I will definitely get to in another day, but for the moment, coming back to the Hellenic Air Force F-4E, um, after the F-4's relatively storied and colorful combat record in the Cold War, uh, many allies of the U.S. were very uh, receptive to purchasing these aircraft. Um, initially, when the F-4E first came out, the U.S. was somewhat reluctant to sell these, but as time went on, uh, the U.S. Uh, administrations changed hands and the political restrictions on selling it went away. So the Hellenic Air Force, the Alini Polamiki Autoporia, um, or EPA, um, purchased a batch of F-4Es in a program called Peace Icarus in 1971. And the contract initially was for 36 F-4Es. I should note here with sincere apologies to people who are of Greek heritage or are fans of the Greek culture and language specifically. Um, I unfortunately am not the most linguistically gifted person. So I will unfortunately, I'm going to do my best to avoid this, but I feel like I'm going to perhaps make a few pronunciation mistakes of the uh, Greek names and titles in this review, and for that I will extend my apologies in advance. Hopefully um, my fans and people watching this will uh, give me some latitude in this area. Uh, coming back to the F4E, the uh, EPA purchased a batch of 36 F4Es, which were supplemented in 1978 and 1979 for an additional 18 F4Es and eight uh, photo reconnaissance RF4Es, which are used to take photos for uh, mission planning, pre-strike reconnaissance info, and post-strike uh, follow-up. So the first squadron in the EPA to activate the F4E was the 339th Ajax uh, Mira, or a squadron, based at Andravidia. Uh, 338 Ares, uh, Ares incidentally is the god of war, which is the reason why on the other side of the F-4E's tail, you will see a figure of a very pissed off, angry, armored god, because Ares represents the uh, god of war and is also the root 
of the horoscopes and some of the zodiac signs which indicate Aries, which I believe is tied to the month of March. So uh, since that happens to be my birth month, if I get that wrong, I'm in real deep shorts. Um, anyways, tangent aside, coming back to the history of it, the 338 Aries Squadron, it's also based off of Andravidia, uh, converted to the F4E in the mid 70s. Um, so if you're tracking the years uh, since the 1970s, the 338 Squadron has been continuously operating the F-4E, uh, this particular aircraft, which is amazing when you think about it. Uh, the F-4 was, again, uh, the F-4E variant came out in 1967. Uh, the Bee Gees wouldn't even hit the radio, excuse me, wouldn't hit the radio for another uh, 12 years. And the F-4E is, um, has been in continuous service with the 338 Squadron of the Hellenic Air Force uh, since the majority of people watching this video were born. I mean, that's crazy. And even now, to this day, as I publish this video, the F-4E is still in frontline service with the Hellenic Air Force, although a recent announcement from the Greek minister for the military is putting some doubt into whether it'll be still in operational service by the end of the year. Sounds like there are going to be making some structural changes and selling some aircraft, such as the uh, earlier Mirage 2000s, some older F-16s, and the F-4E. It's kind of interesting to note that the F-4s uh, have outlasted the political incarnation of the enemy they were built to fight, which was the Soviet Union. And not only did they outlast it, they outlasted it by a few decades. So to this day, the, again, the F-4E is still in frontline service, all these decades later with the uh, Hellenic Air Force, the um, Islamic Republic of Iran Air Force, which inherited them from when the Shah purchased the F-4E in the 1970s, and the South Korean Air Force. Uh, special note, the Japanese recently retired their F-4Es in 2020. So um, yeah, the, this airplane has some pretty serious longevity. Uh, there's people who have been you know, in the military, flown and gotten out, and the F-4E is still flying, which is really cool to note. Um, so after, 19, after the 1980s, uh, the EPA purchased their last batch of new F-4Es in 1991. Uh, many of those F-4s were examples that were flown by the U.S. Air National Guard and then sold as surplus after the Gulf War. In 1993, the EPA issued a contract solicitation for upgrades to their F-4 fleet. Uh, since the Israelis were upgrading the uh, regional opposite uh, Turkey, they were upgrading the Turkish Air Force F-4Es, um, the Israeli vendors were disqualified for political reasons. So the Hellenic Air Force hired German company DASA to upgrade their Phantom IIs. Much of the work involved installing in uh, APG-65 radar, which is in the nose here. That radar is the same radar that's also used in the uh, FA-18 Hornet. Uh, a wide-angle HUD was also installed. A new computer data bus was uh, substituted in place of the old analog system. The air data computer was upgraded, so the uh, Hellenic Air Force F-4Es are compatible with modern precision-guided weapons, such as Paveway 2 laser-guided bombs, the complete family. Uh, remember, this is a the F-4, so it is capable of carrying just about any precision-guided munition out there. Uh, some stuff that may not necessarily fit on the smaller airplanes like the F-16 or the Mirage 2000. And uh, the AIM-120 was integrated onto the aircraft. So with the new digital data bus and the new radar, the AIM-120 AMRAAM missile was also added to the aircraft. Um, we'll circle back to that topic once we get to talking about some of the modifications and things I've done on this model. But the AIM-120 was installed, which is a very big upgrade because this meant that the F-4E could now launch missiles that would independently guide with their own radar, which gives you a different set of tactical options than the original setup, which had the previous generation AIM-7s and the APQ-120 radar. And this program was called the AUP, or the Avionics Upgrade Program. And the first examples were delivered in 2002. And these are the upgraded F-4Es that are still in service to this day. Um, currently, the F-4, this F-4E um, was uh, delivered to the Dutch uh, Air Force uh, 
uh, bash, I'm not saying bash, actually, that's not the correct word. Uh, they went to the, the Dutch Air Force um, Air Show in 2019 and was put on display at that event. So, um, unfortunately, this is the part where I have to share some unpleasant news regarding the disposition of this particular aircraft. So, this F4E, when it was uh, on display, uh, flew very, you know, it flew in, they did their display, and then it flew out. And, um, you know, the, the model of this, the model of the F4E came out when just after that aircraft was on display. So um, at the time that Hobbymaster produced this, there wasn't any particularly sorted history around this aircraft. But unfortunately, in January of 2023, uh, this F4E serial number 1507 uh, tragically crashed in the Aegean Sea during a training mission. Unfortunately, uh, Hellenic Air Force Weapon Systems Officer First Lieutenant Marios Mikhail Torkusitas and the pilot Captain Estathios Teslides uh, perished in the crash. And um, as much as I may not like having to share that, it's worth pointing out here that once again, uh, tactical aviation is not a uh, safe business. Yeah, it's a serious one, and in order to train realistically, uh, squadrons all over the world have to take risks, and sometimes uh, things happen when you're flying at 400, 500, uh, 600 knots at uh, wave top height over the open ocean. Um, one seized control or malfunction or moments in attention or even glancing at a map can mean the difference between uh, coming home safely or um, someone's family getting a visit by a government staff car uh, with a chaplain in the back seat. You know, um, it's a problem and a thing that's happened to just about any Air Force in the world. And um, it's, you know, there's no words that can encompass the pain and misery that comes to a family when they're told that their loved ones aren't coming back. So, um, again, originally when I purchased this model, that obviously hadn't happened. So it was just a really cool looking F4 to add to the collection. But since, um, that crash happened. It actually, interesting side note, um, I was getting ready to make a video about this. As many of you who are subscribers know, I try to make a video about a release relatively close to when it comes out because that means when you all watch my reviews, you can actually buy these and not worry about any um, surcharges or issues because it's been out for over a period of time. And in that time, it got popular and on the secondary market, it's now marked up to the stratosphere, right? So we like to see airplanes in the stratosphere. We don't like to see our invoices for model purchases in the stratosphere, right? So to me, there's no value in delivering a video review of a model that you can't get uh, unless there's some other factors at work. But um, I was going to make a video about this right away and then in January, the news of this hit, and it was this, you know, aircraft serial number that crashed. So um, I put this one on the back burner a bit, did some other videos, and um, now I'm circling back to it because uh, the F4E, they, again, they announced that they're going to retire the F4E, and this is as good a time as any to release this. Plus, um, this has been a project that had been on my list to do for a while anyway, so... Um, I wanted to do justice by those crew members and their families and um, really take this model to the next level and make it look uh, tip top. Uh, not just because it, you know, it just looks really badass on the display stand, but also because there's uh, history behind this. And I want to pay respects to the families of the crew that uh, tragically perished in this aircraft in real life in January of uh, last year. So. Uh, for them, I dedicate this video and this review, and hopefully that's not something I have to say too often when I'm making these. Um, so with that, let's pivot to the pros and cons like I usually do. Uh, pros, the color scheme, the Aegean uh, color scheme is pretty much dead on. Uh, there's no issues with some of the special markings, such as the, uh, the Phantom Spook, which is the name of the figure you see back here. Uh, you'll often see this little guy pop up on other F4s. This is kind of the mascot for the F4E Phantom, as well as some of the earlier ones too. So uh, really cool to see that the Spook, the Phantom Spook, is rendered really nicely here. God of War on the other side is also rendered very well. Um, the 338 Squadron fuel tanks are also done really nicely. And the, 
you know, the, the some of the other smaller details like the rescue labels and the small uh, markings and warning stuff are done really well. So I'm glad to share that that's, uh, that all looks really good. Uh, another pro is the accessories. They all pretty much go on the model just fine. Uh, the landing gear does have some issues, but again, that's kind of a Hobby Master F4 thing. You all who have seen my other reviews of their F4s will know that I've talked about that in the past. Um, so the landing gear is a bit troublesome, but again, that's a Hobby Master F4 thing. Um, the other accessories go on really nicely. There's no sanding or filing needed to get that stuff to fit. And I'm also glad to share that Hobby Master added the accurate electronic uh, accessories. Uh, the AUP upgrade package came with obviously a new data bus, but also with new uh, defensive avionics such as radar warning and missile approach antennas, which you see here on the cheek of the intakes, one here, one on the other side. Uh, you also see accurate antenna for the nose, which you see right here. And then on the back, um, it's, um, you know, it's good to see the Hobby Master got that right. Um, some of the cons of that, and, uh, and I'll just jump right into uh, discussing it, is the, um, the IFF antenna here. These were a royal pain to put on the model, and I... I, I would not hit. <laughs> so when you get these out of the box, you get, I think, eight of these in a little baggie. That's really hard to see. I actually had to um, find out about this on a forum when someone made a forum post because I was like, it's too bad they didn't mold it into the model. And they're like, oh, they're, they're included in a little baggie on the side. And sure enough, I checked the box and there they were. And then I made the mistake of putting them on the model. <sighs> Yeah, you're, you're going to need steady hands and some very small needle nose tweezers. And even then, it's going to be a dicey proposition lining them up. And as you can see from the close up shots that I have, unfortunately, um, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't get all of them as lined up as I would have liked. Um, but uh, trust me, it was it was a fight just to get them to go on the way they were without using too much glue or gluing them in the wrong position or any of that kind of drama. So hopefully Hobby Master will take uh, that to heart and next time they release a Hellenic Air Force F4E, they mold it into the nose um, or, or make like one part that is flush with the top that you can glue on and it has the bird cage, or excuse me, bird slicer antenna for the IFF on there because gluing every single antenna uh, segment separately onto the model is just terrible. Uh, again, would not recommend, but if you want to display this accurately, you kind of have to. Um, would, really would have liked to see that done. Um, the back too, where the cap is for the, um, for the, parachute uh, the radar warning receiver antennas are not modeled there would have liked to see that done but it's not a big deal uh, another con this is just talking about the something i've mentioned before too the lifeless gray in the back uh, the engines are just kind of meh on there um, in reality when you look at the f4 the engines are actually um the, the back of the aircraft as well as the engines are actually reflective metal. That's titanium to uh, help with the heat management, but it's rendered on models and in photos as being like grayish black. And that's because that part of the airplane, if you're taking a photo of it right side up, is usually in shadow. So if you have no light in a reflective area, it looks black. So um, it's understandable. I don't understand why they would have rendered it that way, but um, I would have also liked to see a little bit more life put into the engine, especially when you compare it to some of the nozzles that come out from Caliber and JC wings. I think it will. I think it would take the presentation of this to the next level. And um, speaking of which, that is a good point to transition to talking about the project stuff. So this point here, I think if you are a fan of the Hellenic Air Force F4s or you like F4s in general, I think this is a worthwhile addition to your collection. Um, I do personally recommend that you do some project stuff to make it just a little bit better. But out of the box, it is still a really cool model. Just be careful with those IFF, Identify Friend or Foe, antennas that you have to individually glue on on the nose. It's a tough job, and I would highly recommend that you do not drink coffee for the entire day before you try it. Um, so, 
With that, we'll talk about some of the project stuff. Um, realistically, Hobby Master does not have infinite resources to put extra detail like convincing and realistic weathering, as well as some of the finer details like painting the or recoloring the inside of the intakes to be the white color that they should be, or uh, some of the you know finer points of the weathering. That's stuff that honestly is in the purview of the collector, and I'm glad that Hobby Master makes these clean out of the box um, because then it's a blank canvas. You know, if you want a clean presentation to the model, you get that out of the box. You don't have to do anything. If you want to do some project stuff, though, you have a clean camp canvas to do that. I almost said clean canvas. Uh, <laughs> anyways, so onto the fun stuff, uh, the aft fuselage, right? So the aft part I just mentioned in the pros and cons section, um, when you're looking at the back, uh, that's a relatively easy fix. What I did on this model is I painted it titanium, or excuse me, I didn't paint titanium, I painted it chrome uh, using Mission Models chrome paint. I painted that whole backside of the engine nozzles chrome. It's going to be a little too shiny at first, but just bear with me. Um, what you want to do is once you've painted it chrome, you'll want to add some Tamiya weathering, um, which is going to be kind of the liquid uh, panel line uh, weathering that you can get from them. Uh, and, and just with the engines, you can just go hog wild, put as much as you want on there. For the empennage, for the aft fuselage between the engines, I would leave that uh, chrome. That's just... Uh, because it's going to show a dark presentation anyway if you display the model right side up like you see here. So personally, I, I wouldn't put weathering on it, but it's up to you if you want to make it a little darker. Um, but that's how you can make the engines look really good. And then if you paint the interior of the engine, the J79 engines black, um, you're also going to get a really nice contrast off of that um, the, the finish. So it's going to look really good. Um, I'll see if I can splice in a photo of um, what that looks like from the very back. So uh, I think that's a good uh, modification to do. Next, fuselage weathering. Um, not really much to say about that. Um, I'm using uh, Tamiya powder for this one. I used their uh, oil stain weathering powder and just kind of took a, a template of an uh, this F4E, some of the photos of it, as well as some other... Um, EPA F4s to kind of get a sense of what the weathering looks like on the bottom. Um, some countries like Japan seem to like keeping their F4s really, really, really clean. Other countries like uh, the Hellenic Air Force, they seem to be more concerned about flying them than they are making them look shiny for a general's visit. So it probably speaks to good things about the Hellenic Air Force if their senior officers are worried about how their pilots are flying rather than how shiny their airplanes are. Hint, hint, U.S. Air Force. Anyways, um, so inspections and senior officer jokes aside, uh, weathering it to look like an actual Atlantic Air Force F-4E. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Pick a template, use some of the footage that's out there, some uh, photos and videos, and, um, you know, pause where you need to. Take a look at the bottom. Uh, I think actually some intro footage in this video might help you do that. And then, um, you know, darken and weather to your heart's content. Uh, there's not much else I can say. It's not like I can give you a guide for how much to weather exactly. It's just something that you kind of have to feel out if you, um, you know, want to make your model look a little bit more lively. And then E120s, I added those myself. Um, you can either build some with the kits that are out there from companies like Tamiya. What I used is I took the... Um, I ordered some extra ones from Hobby Master like six months ago, and then I put them to use. Um, I do recommend that you take and uh, cut the back fin if you're going to do that, and make sure you order the AIM 120Bs because those were the versions that came with this F4E AUP. Note carefully that the AIM 120Bs are the only ones that are compatible with this aircraft. It does not have the ability to shoot the AIM 7. As part of the upgrade program, they had to modify the missile. Uh, rails and some of the uh, connecting assemblies underneath the aircraft, uh, one of which that you will see um, under here. So they modified the pylons internally, so those no longer can fire the AIM-7, which is unfortunate because 
that means the AIM-7s that you get in the kit from Hobby Master are not accurate for these Hellenic Air Force F4Es. So um, I took a couple of AIM-120Bs, clipped the back uh, fin off, and put some blue tack on the other fin, put it in the slot, and it seems to, to look all right. Um, don't handle the model too roughly. It'll, it'll stay in place pretty well. So next we have the intakes. What I did is I took some... Um, I took some white um, cardstock and then cut two pieces to match the um, to match the area of the intake as well, like the outside here as well as the inside. And the reason I did that is because the inside on the Hobby Master aircraft is painted body color, and because it's painted body color, you have to you take a paintbrush and go in there and, and repaint it and everything. And that's just a royal pain in the neck. So what you'll need to do is to um, cut it out. I'm going to show the dimensions and how to do that. I'll put it in the video. And then um, if you just take some blue tack, put it on the back, paint it as indicated. Um, you're going to have something that's going to look really good. I know the colors don't precisely match here. Um, I'm going to try to tweak that a little bit later. But if you look up the Aegean color scheme, uh, it'll it'll look pretty solid, and then uh, that'll also fix some of the imperfections from Hobby Master on the intake splitter. So with that, uh, thank you for watching my videos to this point. If you have subscribed, I extend my heartfelt appreciation for showing your uh, support of the channel. And those of you that haven't, uh, consider seeing my other videos. And uh, if you like my reviews and some of the models that I have on the channel, uh, consider putting uh, a like out there, clicking the like button and subscribing, and then you'll be notified when I upload my next review. Once again, thank you all for tuning in, and we will catch you in the next one.